All right, it looks like people are still joining us, but uh, for the sake of time, I'll uh, get us started here. Um, so thank you everyone for joining uh, another CIDREP CWD webinar. We're excited to have you here. Um, I'm Corey Anderson. I'm a graduate uh, research assistant with CIDREP helping with our chronic wasting disease program. Um, I'm excited to welcome everyone. I know we have people from multiple countries, so that's exciting. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, before we sort of kick things off, uh, again, as always, some housekeeping items here. Of course, this is part two of our webinar series on chronic wasting disease diagnostics, um, which will focus on RT Quick technology with the presentation from uh, the very leader of the team that developed the uh, test. Um, if you didn't catch part one, I'd highly recommend checking it out. Uh, we have a recording on our SIDRAP CWD YouTube channel. Um, in part one, uh, doctors Jason Bartz with Creighton University and Tracy Nichols with USDA provided an overview on the currently validated CWD um, assays, IHC and ELISA. Um, so they talked a lot about the science and the application of those tools um, and just really laid out a solid foundation for um, prion diseases and the challenges that they present. And so um, that's sort of a good preface for this one. Otherwise, again, tune into this one. If you have any questions, they might be clarified um, in that one as well, but definitely worth checking out. Um, with this webinar, the format will be the same um, where we will have a presentation and that will be followed by a Q and A. Um, of course, um, while the presentation is going on, please feel free to submit your questions using that Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can submit them at any time. Um, I'll be going through them. And when uh, Dr. Coey is done with this presentation, I'll be selecting some to ask him. Um, we'll try to get through as many as possible as always, uh, depending on time, we'll just run it through the hour. Um, if I don't get to yours, uh, apologies in advance. Um, like I said, as always, you can feel free to email me and I will do my best to connect you with someone who can provide um, an answer to your question. And then last but not least, um, as with all of our presentations or webinars, uh, a recording will be made available on our SIDRAP CWD YouTube channel um, shortly after this is complete. So if you want to rewatch or share with others, um, you can always go there. Again, if you need a link, uh, you can always Google SIDRAP CWD YouTube or feel free to shoot me an email. Um, otherwise, I have it set up where a follow-up email with that link should be provided uh, within the next day or so. Um, so with that, without further ado, I am uh, excited to introduce our expert speaker for today, um, Dr. Byron Coey, uh, who, as I mentioned, will be covering uh, RT Quick and its utility as a diagnostic tool for chronic wasting disease. Um, and so if you're not already familiar, Dr. Byron Coey is a biochemist and senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health's NIAID Rocky Mountain Laboratories. Uh, his graduate work, completed in 1985, was done at the universities of Wisconsin-Madison in London. After postdoctoral work at Duke University, he moved to NIH in 1986. His lab's research has focused mostly on prion diseases, including structure, cell biology, transmissibility, disinfection, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Their ultra-sensitive RT-quick prion seed amplification assays are used in diagnosing prion diseases. More recently, the COE lab has been adapting the RT Quick platform to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and related human diseases with tau or synuclein pathologies. Their collaborative studies with antisense oligonucleotides and prion disease animal models have shown that a single injection near the onset of clinical signs can markedly extend survival times for these otherwise untreatable diseases. Most recently, his group has determined the first high resolution structure of a mammalian prion. He has served as a member of several editorial boards and project review panels. As I mentioned, Dr. Coey is a foremost expert on this topic. Um, I'm sure his presentation will be highly informative. Um, and like I said, I appreciate him uh, joining us today. I know he's very busy. So um, with that, Dr. Coey, I will turn it over to you um, if you want to start sharing your slides. Um, we, we can go from there. So thank you again. Okay, thank you, Corey. Can you hear me? 
Yep, we can hear you and it looks good. All right, thanks so much for the invitation and the introduction. And as Corey said, I think many of you have recently heard in the previous uh, webinars given by Jason Bartz and Tracy Nichols a background for much of what I'm gonna talk about today. And Corey's asked me to talk specifically about the use of RT quick assays in, in CWD diagnostics. And as you presumably all know, uh, the transmission cycle of CWD involves uh, shedding of CWD infectivity into the environment where it can remain stable on various surfaces for long periods of time, then reuptake into animals uh, via ingestion or skin or perhaps nasal mucosal roots and then propagation from these peripheral roots of exposure into the nervous system where it causes uh, devastating disease. Um, and then all the while shedding more prion infectivity, CWD prion infectivity back into the environment. So given that it's, it's become really important to managing your CWD uh, to find better ways of detecting CWD prions. Um, potential sources of infection, including the animals themselves, the environmental environments that they occupy, and feeds and various products of these animals, like uh, the, the meats that hunters derive from hunting these animals. Also, we'd like to detect CWD prions in diagnostic specimens, of course, optimally in live animals and as early as possible, um, but also in excreta and um, and also, of course, there's importance of detecting them as sensitively as possible in post-mortem samples as part of uh, surveillance for, uh, surveillance efforts and to identify infected animals for, for hunters who have harvested these animals. And of course, we want to do all this as, as accurately, inexpensively, and rapidly as possible. So, a key issue here, hmm, uh, of course, is what is a prion and what the molecular basis of prion diseases is. Um, are you getting these, um, trying to get these things to disappear up here? Anyway, um, anyway, the molecular basis of prion diseases involves refolding and aggregation of PRP molecules. So the normal PRP or prion protein um, looks like this based on NMR spectroscopy. It's got well-folded, these sort of corkscrew-like structures, of course, as a protein, it's a string of, uh, of amino acids. So it's got this well-folded region here and it's got less floppy, it's got floppy regions here that are less well-folded and it's tethered to two biological membranes by lipid anchored and it's got sugars on it. So, but the pathogenic or self-propagating prion form of this protein PRP, which we also call the seed or the template, looks like this. And this is uh, a structure that we've um, just figured out to high resolution. It's the first such structure that we know of in, in mammalian prions. And we've, although we've posted it online in bioarchive, it's not even really, it's not yet been published in the peer-reviewed journal. But basically, this dastardly form of prion protein amounts to a stack, long stack assembly of, of, of prion protein molecules with their amino acid chains following this track um, in these twists and turns throughout the molecule. So each, each rung you see here in this aggregate is an individual PRP molecule and one molecule spans the entire cross section of this aggregate. And this surface here that's facing you out of the screen basically um, has this ability somehow to grab on to normal uh, PRP molecules that are in the vicinity and cause it to lay out along this very same template or track to faithfully propagate this particular strain. Now this strain of prion that we've solved the structure of here um, is from uh, hamsters infected with scrapie. We have, um, we have other data that's not as high resolution yet for a mouse scrapie prion, 
which shares some features with this, but seems to be different in other places, but we're not quite sure about the details yet. So that's a manifestation of, of, of strain. Um, so the, 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 the shape that you have here at the end of these fibrils then differs with prion strain. And you can expect the same thing to be true of CWD prions. So the CWD, so the surrogate prion protein molecule has a little bit different amino acid sequence. And on top of that, different strains of CWD are likely to have different uh, sorts of arrangements or shapes here uh, that can faithfully propagate as prions do to cause devastating neurodegenerative uh, disease. And so with the seed amplification assays that, that Jason gave an introduction to in his talk, including uh, protein misfolding cyclic amplification. For some reason, I've lost my cursor here. Hold on. Oh, excuse me. Well, it's not giving it. Nah, I don't know why it's doing that. There we go. Um, anyway, the seed amplification assays that are being used so much for prion disease diagnosis, including the protein misfolding cyclic amplification assay developed initially by Claudia Soto's lab and our RT quick assays, um, mimic this process, at least to some extent in vitro, to allow massive amplification of prions in, in a test tube. And so to um, some reason. Any advice there? Um, uh, it's not letting you advance. Is that correct? Right. Um, um, if you try right clicking and seeing if a window pops up and asks to advance. I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Finally, it's uh... right. So to simplify this whole process um, rather dramatically in cartoon form, we have these ordered aggregates or clumps of PRP molecules shown here that we call prion seeds. And these have the ability, as I mentioned before, to grab on to normal, individual normal PRP molecules that are in the vicinity, either in our test tubes or in, in the body, uh, and cause it to change its shape and be recruited into this growing aggregation, into this growing aggregate that elongates and then fragments to give you more prions than you started with. And these aggregates, these long fibrillar-like aggregates that you get, we call amyloid fibers. And to um, allow this to happen, um, or to, to, to perform this sort of assay from a practical point of view, what we, we and, and, and many others have done now is perform this sort of process, this, this cyclic process to go round and round and round and get tremendous amplification with, um, if we keep providing more normal PRP molecules into this cycle. Um, we can perform this in a simple plastic plate, what we call a multi-well plate with multiple holes in it. Each one can carry out a reaction. So into each well of this 96 or 384 well plate, you provide a little bit of your test specimen that may or may not have prions, together with a vast excess of normal PRP molecules and an amyloid sensitive dye, amyloids being these fibrillar-like structures that lights up and fluoresces um, in the presence of amyloid fibrils, but not in the presence of the normal PRP molecules. You put this plate into a fluorescence plate reader that shakes these assay, these, um, that shakes the reaction and measures fluorescence periodically as the reaction goes on. And if you have prion seeds in your sample, um, you make these fibrils, the, these amyloid-like aggregates, and the dye fluoresces. And if you read the fluorescence shown here on this plot as fluorescence, this is a sum of 
fluorescence from eight replicate reactions um, in, in such a plate as a function of time of reaction. If you have prions in your sample, you'll get very rapid production of large amounts of amyloid fibrils and a big increase in fluorescence. And so what I'm also showing here is that you can, and these are reactions seeded with some scrapey brain homogenate from, from hamsters, so squished up brain. What's showing here is uh, sets of eight reaction well seeded with sequential tenfold dilutions of brain homogenate. And it's only out to um, a billion fold dilution of this uh, prion infected brain that some of the reactions uh, no longer become positive in this reaction. And another tenfold dilution, so 100 billion fold dilution, uh, only one of the wells is firing. Whereas normal brain at any of these dilutions is flat negative. So we've designed these, we and others have designed these assays to be extremely sensitive, allowing billion to trillion fold amplification of the presence of the seeds. In, um, and, and in humans, uh, for human prion disease, such as sporadic CJD or variant CJD, we can de detect dilutions Found uh, uh, dilutions as extreme as 10 to the 14th fold of, of infected human brain. And so, what does this really mean? Well, um, this means uh, essentially that if you take a pin high, pinhead sized piece of brain, mush it up, and dilute it into 40 Olympic swimming pools, um, you can, and take a similar little uh, size vo volume out of that swimming pool, you can still. Uh, one of those swimming pools, you can still uh, detect the reactions. It's extraordinarily sensitive. These assays are getting faster and faster. It usually takes one to two days. And importantly, from a practical point of view, the amplified products are not infectious, as we've shown uh, very recently. You don't want to be amplifying massive amounts of prion infectivity every time you do run these assays in a diagnostic laboratory. So, the, now, as far as the sensitivity goes for CWD detection, uh, Aaron McNulty and, and Candice Mathiasen's lab recently published this comparison of various diagnostic immunoassays, Western blot and ELISA, with seed amplification assays, namely PMCA, which Jason Barks explained, and I'm not going to explain in any more detail today, and RT Quick. And basically, what's plotted here. Uh, um, or is whether or not a given assay listed here can detect prions or prion, uh, prions essentially in various serious sequential tenfold dilutions of cervid brain uh, brain homogenate containing CWD you know, from a CWD infected animal. So uh, all the way out to here, this would be a million fold dilution. This is a tenfold dilution. This is a million fold and a billion fold dilution. You can see that standard assays uh, such as Western blot and ELISA only can detect out to say a hundred fold dilution according to their side-by-side -side analysis. The gold standard mouse bioassay, basically a cervidized um, mouse bioassay is much more sensitive, can detect out to a million fold dilution of, uh, of the cervid brain homogenate. Um, but of course these assays take months if not greater than a year to, to perform. Um, there's a version of, of the standard form of PMCA with Western blot readout is similarly sensitive, whereas RT quick assays can be a little, even a little bit more sensitive than that, getting out to 10 million fold dilution of the brain homogenate. And a combination of these two has been, has been described, uh, it gets a little more sensitive than that. So in essence, PMCA and RT Quick and the combination of the two, which is most sensitive, were about 10,000 to one to 10 million times more sensitive than standard Western blot and ELISA immunoassays that are used in CWD diagnostics, uh, and are therefore more likely to detect low levels of prions in accessible clinical specimens and environmental uh, samples as well. So PMCA and RT Quick are as sensitive as or up to 100 times more sensitive than the gold standard uh, animal bioassay. So if there's an infectious amount of prion in a sample, uh, amplification assays, both of these should detect it.
So just a further comparison of the, the seed amplification assays, namely PMCA or RT quick. Um, I point out that the technical simplicity of the RT quick is considerably more simple than PMCA. It's also a lot more rapid um, assay time of one to two days as opposed to one to three weeks for PMCA. They're similarly sensitive in an analytical sense. Um, that is much more sensitive than say Western blot. Um, a throughput is also probably a bit higher for RT quick. And it, whereas the PMCA products are, are highly infectious, which is really good for research purposes, uh, bad for routine diagnostics, RT quick amplified products are not. So both of these assays are much faster than animal bioassays, the latter of which may take months in excess of a year, are useful for specimens in which immunohistochemistry, ELISA or Western blot are inadequate um, for various reasons, notably sensitivity. Um, they can detect prions in tissues, fluids, and excrete at most stages of infection, including preclinical. They're great for research and for accurate confirmation of other tests, perhaps these, for instance, uh, which is a valuable um, thing to have. But RT quick compared to PMCA is, uh, at this point in time, more practical for routine detection under many circumstances. So what about RT quick assays in general for prion diseases? We now, with the work of, of many laboratories around the world, have tests, RT quick tests for virtually all the known PRP-based prions of mammals, a total of at least 29, higher than that now. Um, the technology has been pushed furthest for, for diagnosis of human prion disease, most notably sporadic called Jakob disease, in which case, when you analyze, you can use it to analyze spinal fluid and nasal brushings, you can get basically 99% accurate di anti-mortem diagnosis of, of human CJ, the sporadic CJD. And, a, and a, a positive test in this assay in humans is a key official criterion for, the, for a diagnosis of probable uh, CJDs um, in, in, in humans. So, we also know more recently in work that we, collaborative work we've performed with uh, Wen Chan Zhu and, and Christina uh, Sigurdsson's labs and Michael Geshwin's lab, that skin and eye specimens from humans with prion disease also usually contain prions and may be useful diagnostically. And we've also shown um, that prion seeds can be detected in skin very early in the preclinical phase in rodents, which is important for um, a CWD application that I'm gonna uh, show you later on in the talk. So what about uh, RT quick tests for CWD specifically? And this, this is uh, data that uh, this shows that we published on the first detection of CWD from, from a cervid using RT quick. And basically um, it, it's shown here, um, uh, reactions seeded with roughly millionfold dilutions of CWD brain with the reactions performed in various concentrations of salt. And it just shows basically that we can detect um, CWD uh, in, in quite dilute CWD brain homogenates, and that our ability to do so is dependent, not surprisingly, on this, the amount of salt that we have in, in those reactions. But at least in this initial analysis, we were able to detect um, prion CWD seeding activity in brain homogenate diluted at least a million fold in a very small volume, two microliters, about a pinhead size volume, containing four femtograms of PRP, about four femtograms of, 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 of PRP CWD. And so that's four times 10 to the minus 15th power, very, very small amount. And as is true for many RT quick assays of all sorts, uh, it's important to find op optimal salt concentrations and optimal other conditions to get these reactions to work, to work well. Um, and those conditions will differ between uh, prion types, the prion types of prions and strains of prions that you're trying to assay in the specimens that you're trying to uh, evaluate. 
So uh, this just shows some uh, what a typical result from an RT quick analysis of retropharyngeal lymph nodes from CWD infected um, mule deer looks like. And of course, retropharyngeal lymph node is a standard diagnostic tissue now. And so what we're showing here is reaction seeded with lymph node uh, diluted again by serial uh, successive tenfold dilution. So it starts out at a 10,000 fold dilution of lymph node going to tenfold greater dilution, tenfold, 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 all the way out to it's that 100 million fold dilution uh, from um, either from lymph nodes uh, collected from CWD negative animals in the top row here. I don't know if you're, this is obscured for you here where we get almost no positive signal at all from five different CWD infected animals compared to lymph nodes collected from animals that were given a week that had weekly positive responses in ELISA as determined by uh, Mike Miller's lab in, in Colorado and, and five animals that were given had strong positive ELISA readings. And what you can see basically is that while well, the negative, the, the non-CWD samples were essentially all negative, uh, the weak positive samples were able to dilute out to say a million fold or so sometimes, but the strong ELISA positive uh, lymph nodes went out still farther. So even with a retropharyngeal lymph node, we're able to get in some cases positive reactions out to a, um, a hundred million fold dilution of those lymph nodes. So strong positive uh, RLM samples usually dilute out uh, further before loss of, uh, of the response compared to the weak positive. And the concentration of CWD seeds in a retropharyngeal lymph node correlates roughly with the strength of the ELISA response. It's, it's rough. So um, just to give some highlights, and there's probably been, I think, at least 50 papers published on use of RT Quick for various aspects, various studies of CWD. And this is just a few highlights that I wanted to bring up for you today. Um, so first, in terms of post-mortem analysis of, of, of brain and, and RLN, uh, i.e. these officially approved tissues for CWD diagnostics, um, uh, a few large studies, one of them containing 1,200 animals or so, um, have shown 100% concordance between RT quick um, analyses and ELISA and IHC analyses of retropharyngeal lymph node in cervids collected in the field from areas with current or historic CWD and denicity. Uh, in other words, hunter kill. And so these several papers, one of which um, we've been, one of which or two of which we've been involved with ourselves. Um, we, we and others have also shown, as I mentioned before, the recombinant PRPC substrate that you use, that is the normal PRP that you put lots of into these reactions and other reaction conditions can really influence the extent, um, you know, the results that you get from various RT quick assays of various strains of prions and, and various tissue types, tissue sample types, you know, sample tissue types. Um, so, also, Hang et al. have shown that the, uh, at least when you use bank bowl or human PRPC, the normal PRP as uh, normal PRP as a substrate for these reactions, the genotype of the cervid that you took your sample from seems to have little effect, though it can matter when you use uh, other substrates. For instance, in L, they also showed that uh, if you use the, the host genotype at codon 132 and recombinant substrate, that is methionine versus leucine at 132 in, in your substrate, in elk back, and in the elk background, effect reaction kinetics. So you can get a little bit of all kinds of effects here. So all this has to be optimized as you're working out these assays. So what about antimortem um, use of RT quicks for uh, antimortem testing for CWD? And there's particular challenges associated with live animal testing. I mean, brain, cerebral, spinal fluid, and nasal brushings that have worked so well, of course, for humans. 
uh, are hard to get from live servants in the field. So we need to be able to use more accessible specimens. And early preclinical testing capability for live animals is needed, of course, to improve our ability to manage, the, detect and manage the disease. And so the test should be as inexpensive, as I mentioned before, and rapid as, as possible. So more accessible, uh, there's a list of more accessible specimens, which various groups have shown um, are suitable for RT quick um, for, for detection um, of seeding activity by uh, RT quick. And those include lymphoid biopsies, including the rectal anal mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, the, the, the tonsil, um, blood components, uh, be variable in, in deer, uh, looks promising sometimes and not so much others. Same is true for uh, saliva, it contains an inhibitor that, in there, that uh, I think recent studies are suggesting might be able to get around. Feces uh, provides an early and continued source of shedding and, is, and it can be, and ground seeding activity can be stably, uh, uh, stable and detectable in environmental uh, specimens. Uh, urine, you can also detect ground seeding activity early in the preclinical phase. And, and I'm gonna, and also skin, and as I'll mention further in third eyelid. So from here on out, I'm just gonna highlight some studies on the lymphoid biopsies, the skin, and the third eyelid. Now, this is a study from, from um, Nick Haley, Jurgen Richt, and, and, and colleagues, um, uh, white-tailed deer, farmed white-tailed deer, a uh, total of 409 of those animals uh, looking anti-mortem detection of CWD in both nasal brushings and also these remote specimen biopsy specimens. So um, of the 200, of this 409, 289 of these animals were determined to be uh, CWD positive by post-mortem immunohistochemistry of either a lymph node or brain stem. Um, and of those 122, uh, were detectable antimortem by IHC of Umal, the immunohistochemistry, giving a 42% diagnostic uh, uh, sensitivity. Whereas when you use RT Quick uh, of Umal, you can get 196 animals uh, positive by this, giving a, a bit higher sensitivity than was possible with the um, immunohistochemistry. And the Umal testing by RT Quick. Uh, gave a greater than 94% specificity, one case uh, uh, from two, two herds uh, that were um, looked at in this study. And nasal brushing, suffice it to say, didn't work very well. It's in fact very hard to do a proper nasal brushing. You need to get all the way back in, way back into the back to the olfactory mucosa, and that's a bit hard, hard to do in a survey. It's easy to do in a human, hard to do in a survey. So we're going to forget about nasal brushings, even though there works. So another study from uh, Michaela and Jurgen Richt and, and various others, um, including my group, um, look, look at elk, um, a farm, both farm cohort and a free ranging cohort, fairly large numbers here. Um, in the farm cohort, 44 were determined to be CWD positive by postmortem by IHC analysis, immunohistochemistry of lymph node or brain stem. Of these, um, and, and there's actually analysis of these, of remote from these same animals uh, by either IHC or RT quick, gave very high degree of agreement. In both cases, 34 animals were determined to be positive out of the, the 44, just not exactly in all cases, the same ones. Uh, the free ranging um, group, um, a total of uh, five CWD animals, the incidence is much lower in this group. Uh, five were de determined to be positive postmortem by antemortem analysis of IHC of Remalt and RT Quick of Remalt. So 100% agreement in, in this group. So overall, antemortem Remalt testing by IHC and RT Quick gave approximately 70% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Again, as I mentioned, nasal brushings gave very poor sensitivity, so we're forgetting about that. So 
another Nick Haley paper looked at branched elk and uh, aspects of management um, might be helped by RT Quick and a blinded testing of anti-mortem remolt from 553 elk uh, gave 86 uh, CWD positive animals by IHC and 121 by RT Quick. Um, so again, RT Quick seems to be more sensitive at detecting CWD animals under these conditions. So still another Nikaley um, paper here, uh, um, coordinated an assessment by five uh, separate laboratories to look at a large panel of um, samples collected, remote samples collected from, from elk. And uh, so all of these labs, including ours, did five, uh, did uh, independent blind, blinded testing of these remote specimens. And, and uh, as shown here, I won't go through the detailed numbers, but similar numbers of, of positive animals were collected by each group, uh, each laboratory here. So there's as quote, un quote unquote, considerable agreement across the five laboratories. No animals in this study were found to be RT quick positive anti-mortem um, that were later found to be uh, IHC negative post-mortem. So the specificity seems to be pretty good. So overall, the sensitivity of blinded and anti-mortem testing of remote in this study um, I, immunohistochemistry gave 45%, um, and RT quit gave 83%. Uh, if you look combined data from all of the labs, uh, if you just, uh, from the individual labs, it's more like 65 to 70% sensitivity. So again, more evidence that RT quit be an effective tool in the anti-mortem detection of, of CWD. So another interesting thing, uh, study from, um, Cooper et al. and Ed Hoover's lab and Candace Mathias's lab is looking at um, third eyelids of cervids with RT quick. And so, in, in, as far as uh, they looked at CWD infected a white tailed deer, they found that 24 out of 25 or 96% of third eyelids were, were positive in these animals and could be detected as early as one month after experimental exposure and in naturally exposed asymptomatic CWD positive elk, um, they've got 80, 18 out of 25 or 72% of the third eyelids uh, positive. So, and, and, and as far as early symptomatic uh, white, white, in early symptomatic white-tailed deer, 10 out of 10 were positive by RT quick and five out of 10 were positive by immunohistochemistry. So the third eyelid is, easily accessible as I understand it, um, uh, uh, tissue and has potential to advance CWD detection. So one thing in the last part of the talk that I uh, want to discuss is the, the question that we've been asking in collaboration with Mike Miller and Tracy Nickel and, and Ed Hoover's groups, is, can RT quick testing of ear punches improve the practicality of CWD testing? given that, that such samples would likely be easier to collect than, than remote or, or, or retroprendial lymph node or brain node codex, especially from, uh, from uh, live animals. So an initial study we, we, we launched into in collaboration with the people that I mentioned before, uh, we applied our, our, at that time, current CWD adapted RT quick assay to, to the, ears of 167 apparently asymptomatic hunter killed deer that were designated as apparent CWD positive or negative according to ELISA assays on their, uh, on their retropharyngeal lymph nodes. These were provided by Mike Miller and assayed by Jorge Charco who was visiting the lab for several months from Joaquin Castilla's lab in Spain. And the upshot of all of this was we were analyzing the, the well, I'm not sure what part of you we're analyzing, to be honest, in this, this particular study. Um, the, this analysis using our assay at the time gave ins insufficient diagnostic sensitivity. Oh yeah, it was the tip of the year, which is less than 50%. So we needed improvements, as we often do when developing, applying these assays to new tissue specimens. And so we found in, initially um, in the work of Michael Metric, a grad student in my lab, 
that he could that he could enhance the tech detection of CWD in outer ear punches using sodium iodide, uh, which is a, just a different salt as opposed to sodium chloride. And what uh, what I want to point out here, the data I'm showing here is the lag time uh, from these assays. It's just a convenient way to show many results at once. And the lag time, just to define it for you, if you take the kind of assay, our typical RT quick trace that I've been showing you all along, it, it takes a certain amount of time before it gets positive, goes above a, a threshold that discriminates positive from negative samples. That's the lag time. So the shorter the lab time is, the stronger the signal and the higher the concentration of prion seeding act is prion seeds in, in your sample. And so what I'm looking showing you here are samples from, the, from reactions that are run with sodium chloride versus samples run in sodium iodide. Um, seeded either with uh, outer ear samples from CWD negative animals, N1 through N5, um, five of them then, uh, or CWD positive animals shown here. So in sodium chloride, again, the shorter the, the lag time, the stronger the reaction. So we, with lymph nodes, we get really strong reactions from all of the CWD positive animals um, from um, using retropharyngeal lymph node, dilute one to a thousand. With ear homogenates, however, we didn't get very good performance uh, um, using sodium chloride. We only picked up a short lag times for a couple of the positive animals that were really distinguishable from what we were getting from the negative animals. But this improved a bit using sodium iodide. So in this case, uh, four out of the five positive animals, ear homogenates, gave us short lag times and therefore were distinguishable from what we were getting from negative controls. So um, that's what I've already said here. So uh, this, this all goes to show that each, each new uh, specimen type requires optimization as we've learned over the years and many other labs as well. As well. Another innovation that was suggested to us by Ed Hoover's group and Nate Dankers was, a, was the use of iron oxide magnetic extraction using these little magnetic beads to bind the prions in the deer, in the mushed up deer uh, ears um, to, to pull out the prion seeds before you put them into the art quick assay. And so this is initial testing of mule deer ear tips, again, either tip, middle or bottom portion of this outermost part of the ear. Again, using uh, specimens from deer with either ELISA negative weak positive or strong positive retropharyngeal lymph nodes, with this being, of course, the, the, the standard diagnostic specimen. And so in this type of assay, using iron oxide, we compared either the use of the iron oxide um, um, magnetic extraction here and here or, or without um, here and here. Um, in either case, the negative, uh, the CWD negative animals gave no response. Weak, weakly ELISA positive CWD positive animals gave this sort of response here that would seem to be pretty similar, though a little bit better with the iron oxide, with the IOME extraction. Strong positive animals, likewise, somewhat better. We get more positive reactions using the, the bead ex extraction. So, we got positive signals from infected deer and, and, the, and the bead extraction gets more positive replicate reactions. So therefore improves sensitivity. So then when we applied this, um, well, another thing we investigated, and this is work of Natalia Ferreira um, in, in the lab, um, used to be in the lab anyway. Uh, she asked what part of the ear might be the best uh, specimen for diagnostic testing. So she took samples from seven different positions around the rest of the year here, um, she described as area one, two, three, four, and so forth. And again, the, uh, and looked at the lag time. Again, the, the shorter the lag time, the stronger the reaction. And basically the upshot of all this is the area seven here in the middle, which spans the auricular nerve seems to give the most reliably positive 
uh, responses from weak positive and strong positive, uh, ELISA positive uh, CWD infected animals. So area seven seems to be best, though several areas uh, work, work pretty well. None of them work perfectly. Um, and this is uh, studies from both white tail and, and mule deer in this example. So let me just finally summarize our blinded, her blinded analysis of, of, of another panel of ear specimens that Mike Miller uh, sent to us. And this included 58 deer, which are 53 mule deer and five white tail, uh, 56 were hunter killed and apparently healthy, uh, two were submitted for uh, diagnostic examination. And again, these retropharyngeal lymph nodes from these animals were screened by ELISA and RT-QUIC. And in this case, with these lymph node samples, no uh, bead extraction was needed. And, and by both assays, gave 100% concordance between the two assays, indicating 26 CWD positive animals and 32 negative out of this initial group of 58. The ears, and this is area seven, uh, on the other hand, gave 24 positive animals and 34 negative by RT quick. And, um, but three of the um, ear positive tests were from uh, lymph node negative deer. So they looked like false positives. And so the question that we still have yet to address, um, would the, are these false positives due to assay error or some sort of cross-contamination between samples, bearing in mind that these are extremely sensitive assays, so cross-contamination is, is a real possibility? Or are they real positives from deer without detected, detected or detectable infection in the lymph node? We, we don't know the difference. But in any case, the upshot of it is, compared to uh, retropharyngeal lymph node-based diagnosis, um, the RT quick assay of the ears um, gave a sensitivity of 81%, specificity uh, uh, of 91%. Uh, of course, the sensitivity being the percentage of, anim of CWD animals giving a positive reaction, and the specificity being the percentage of CWD negative animals giving negative results. These are then comparable to these ear tests, then are comparable to or better than remote based, remote biopsy based RT quick. So, well, we still have a lot to do. Um, we have to do more testing, uh, comparing ear samples to tissues. We've got to look at a lot more hunter killed, road killed animals, deep animals that have been depopulated for surveillance purposes, experimentally an, uh, infected animals to establish reasons for apparently false readings and to uh, optimize the assay for improved accuracy and to figure out just how early we can pick up infections in ear. And um, we need to develop a standard protocol for sampling of area seven and other, uh, or, or another effective area of skin. So just to conclude, in terms of high, uh, highlights uh, with these prion seed amplification assays, and I'm talking again about RT Quick and PMCA. And again, if you want to learn about PMCA, go back to hear um, Jason Bartz's earlier webinar. Both are extraordinarily sensitive tests for prions that can allow detection in samples that would not be positive by any other tests, including tissues, fluids, excreta, environmental specimens. MCA is, is more biologically faithful. In other words, it really amplifies bona fide prion infectivity. That makes it great for research, but not so great for routine diagnostics. So RT Quick at this point in time is more practical, faster, and safer for routine testing, uh, and because the tested products are not infectious. We get in, um, nearly 100% accurate anti-mortem di diagnosis of human sporadic CJD using CSF or nasal brushings. In terms of CWD, we get between 65 and 83% sensitivity and 94 to 100% specificity in the anti-mortem detection of CWD in cervids using Remalt. And this can be then uh, roughly twice as sensitive diagnostically as uh, analysis of remote by immunohistochemistry. Um, we get 81% uh, sensitive and 91% specific so far of uh, performance in anti-mortem detection of CWD in cervids using ear punches. 
which again is comparable to or better than remote-based RT quick. The, the technology seems to be uh, transferable. It can be performed similarly well in multiple labs, but from a practical point of view, um, it still has the, the, the problem of needing central, uh, centralized spe specialized testing um, and cannot really be performed in the field. So we need to address those issues as well. So finally, I wanna say uh, thanks to the many, many collaborators that we've had over the years in working up various prion disease RT quick assays, including for humans that I mentioned here, um, with especially with, with focus on the CWD, uh, we've collaborated extensively with um, Mike Miller, Karen Griffith, um, and uh, Jorge Charco, Joaquin Castilla um, in Spain, and, and a number of other people, including Tracy Nichols, um, and at CSU, Ed Hoover's group and Ed Kenneth and Thiasson's group have been really helpful in, in, in these studies, Nick Haley, Ruth and Rick, uh, um, and, and, and others listed here. And I just wanted to point out the people from my lab who are uh, involved in the unpublished work or published, recently published or unpublished work regarding CWD that I mentioned, especially Natalia Tejera. Um, she's moved on to scripts now. Michael Metric, who developed, did the sodium iodide uh, study, um, and Jorge Charco, as I mentioned. Also, in terms of the prion structure work, especially Allison Krauss, who now has her own lab at, at Case Western Reserve, and Andy Houston in the lab. So with that, um, I'll thank you for your attention and take any questions at this time. That was Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Coey. That was an excellent overview of RT Quick and PMCA. Uh, very much appreciated for people like me um, who hopefully got a better understanding of that. Um, and so I think we have time here for at least a couple of questions, hopefully, um, before we let you go. Uh, the first one that we got is, is a bit more technical. Um, so maybe we can uh, answer this fairly quickly. So uh, the question is, is the dye conjugating to a specific antigen on the fibrils? I'm assuming that is in reference to the RT quick uh, assay. Um, no, it, it's, it's not totally sure how uh, certain how it interacts, but it's, it interacts with a motif uh, that is created by this uh, stack, stacking of many PRP molecules in what is a parallel and register beta sheet structure. So this dye lights up any amyloid, uh, most any amyloid fibril um, composed of many different types of proteins. So it's really sort of the structural motif that excites this uh, uh, fluorescent dye rather than any particular antigen, antigen excitement. Perfect. Um, the next one sort of, uh, it might be a lot to unpack, and so maybe we'll just sort of touch on it broadly, but um, we had a, a registrant who asked, how often do false positive results happen? Um, and maybe, we, like I said, we can expand that. I know it's, it's a complex answer, but maybe you could just sort of uh, briefly touch on what might cause false positive or false negative results when it comes to, to RT quick. Right, well, this, I mean, in, in designing these assays, um there's almost always a, a point or a time during the reaction at which sort of spontaneous assembly of the prion protein, the normal prion protein that you have in your reaction can start to occur. So you're always needing to compare um, how fast the reaction goes with a sample that can already contains prion seeds versus the rate at which spontaneous assembly occurs. And so you just try to develop conditions that separate those as much as you possibly can. So usually false positives happen when you don't have, when you have low concentrations of prions in your diagnostic specimen so that the, the relative rates of those reactions get close to, to the spontaneous uh, aggregation of the protein in your reaction. So usually it's when you're pushing sensitivity limits uh, of the assay, so samples that contain very low concentrations of, of seed, which is true of many of these uh, accessible diagnostic specimens, and you just have to keep, there's no set answer as to how often they occur, but we, we just have to 
uh, improve the sensitivity and specificity as much as we can and determine the cutoffs, the way we discriminate positive from negative in a practical sense by comparing the relative speeds of the prion seeded versus the spontaneous reactions. And that's gonna to have to be accept, uh, assessed for every kind of diagnostic specimen under all circumstances and just establish a track record that can be used with a certain level of certainty. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, we have another question here. Um, People are wondering why uh, RT Quick products are not infectious and PMCA products are. Uh, could you speak to that? Yeah, so um, the thing is that happens in RT Quick assays is that um, we really don't create uh, amyloid fibril products that involve, that involve complete, the complete prion structure. We're only sort of refolding part of the PRP molecules that are present in a real prion. So we only partially replicate that conversion process, whereas PMCA completely replicates and recreates the entire prion structure because it has cofactors and so forth in there that are required for that that we leave out most intentionally of RT quick assays so that we don't create the fully infectious structure. Perfect. Um, here we have another question. It looks like um, Evelyn is wondering if you could uh, talk to or talk about the sensitivity of R RT quick for uh, detecting CWD from deer feces. And if it is known whether factors such as uh, collection or weather, et cetera, could influence the results. Uh, yeah, a bit of work's been done on that. Um, it, and I don't have all that information uh, in, in my head, um, but papers have been published uh, to some extent on the stability of prion seeding activity in feces in the environment. And I mean, I, I'm not sure the whole story is known, but it's uh, studies, some studies have indicated that it can last a long time in the environment. And I'm not sure right off the top of my head, you know, whether wet, dry, also various uh, conditions, you know, how much is known about whether those conditions matter, but they're very important issues to consider. Perfect, and maybe we'll get to one more here uh, before we wrap up. Um, so we have a question from a listener and, and like I said, maybe we'll sort of broaden this one. Um, but David says he's a hunter and of course he's incredibly interested in the ability to test uh, harvested deer for CWD prior to consumption of the meat. And so he asks, uh, do you envision any affordable test kit that may hold utility for a layperson to a good degree of confidence? Or is this a long way off in the future, even beyond practicality? And like I said, I'm not sure if you can speak exactly to that. So maybe we'll broaden it and say, uh, where do you see the world of CWD diagnostics heading and, and what has you most hopeful and what major challenges should we be anticipating? Sort of a, a lot to unpack there, but uh, maybe it's good to finish on that note. Yeah, well, I mean, this is very important questions. I think we have to continue to test large numbers of real world samples of various sorts to figure out where we get the best bang for a buck and trying to um, perform these assays. Another really crucial, um, you know, and, and to understand better how early in animals um, you can pick up uh, the CWD seeding activity with these ultra-sensitive tests, how early you can pick up infections um, from various specimens. Um, a lot of work needs to be done in making this all more practical. Um, in other words, getting centralized uh, testing laboratories that are really comfortable rapidly testing and turning around samples using even existing RT quick tests. But there's also a lot of improvements, improvements that can be done to optimize the assays for specimens that are the most accessible from live animals, or whether we're talking about skin, skin, blood, you know, all the remote, all the samples that I mentioned, feces, urine, and so forth. A lot, and then, you know, a lot of improvements can be made in that way to make the assays faster and, and cheaper. 
And um, whether or not this kind of amplification assay could ever be adapted to the field, you know, so that a lay person or even a, you know, anyone else for that matter, who is trained could perform these assays in the field remains to be determined. I mean, we have ideas or fanciful ideas in our head about how that might ultimately be possible, but we're nowhere near that point. Um, but it's an important goal to, to get to. Perfect. Well, with that, it looks like we are one minute over. And of course, I don't want to take up any more of your time, Dr. Coey. Um, and so thank you again, everyone, for joining. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Like I said, a recording of this will be made available uh, shortly on our SIDRAP CWD YouTube channel. Um, and last but not least, thank you, Dr. Coey, uh, for the excellent uh, presentation, the great overview on this topic, um, and for, of course, your, your answers to those questions. So uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, we appreciate everyone for joining. Um, and keep tabs because uh, we will have future CWD webinars coming up. And so uh, we'll keep you updated on that. Um, and like I said, feel free to email me with any questions you might have, and I'll pass them along to people who can provide you an answer. So thank you again, um, and 